Hey there everybody, my name is Dan and welcome to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to show you how I made this katana. I made it for a great friend of mine who turned 50 this year. What better way to combine his love of Tashiro Mifune and my love of woodworking? Before we get started, I want to apologize for the length of the video. The friend I made the katana for is considering becoming an aspiring woodworker, so I wanted to include as much detail as possible. I also want to apologize for any pronunciation errors going forward. I don't speak Japanese, but I promise I'll do my best. Overall, I'm extremely happy with how the katana came out, so now let me show you how I made it. When I was picking out a species of lumber to use for the blade, I saw this quarter sawn sycamore and knew that it would be perfect. To be honest, I started this project without thinking about filming, so these pieces had already been milled. After letting the two halves acclimate to my shop, I took a careful look at them and decided which one I would use. I wanted to make sure the piece was flat and had some nice character. As I've learned by watching countless YouTube videos, many projects start with a template, and this one is no different. I cut out the template using my Cricut, tape it together, and then transfer it to the sycamore. This sword is loosely based on the Hattori Hanzo sword from Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill films. Once the pattern has been traced, I head over to the bandsaw to cut out the blade. I'm using the bandsaw because it excels at cutting curves. If you don't have a bandsaw, you can get similar results using a handheld jigsaw. The goal here is to cut close to the line, but not directly on it. After cutting, I set up my belt sander to refine the shape of the blade and sand right up to my line. It's easier to finesse the shape using the sander, because it is a much more delicate process as opposed to going at it all barbaric-like with a spinning steel blade. It's a slow process, but I take my time and sneak up to my pencil line. Since the blade is curved, I use both sides of the sander to avoid any divots. This may not be a best practice, but it works. After a good bit of sanding and refining the shape, I was happy with the look of the blade. Next, I turned my attention to the tsuka, or handle. Using the table saw, I cut two pieces to the same length. Since I knew how thick I wanted the tsuka to be, I used my micro jig fit finder to determine exactly half the thickness of the tsuka. Those two pieces got cut to that thickness by running them vertically through the saw. Since I started this project on a Saturday morning, that meant it was time for... Morning Brown! Morning Brown! Get yourself a cup of Morning Brown! Morning Brown! Fueled by Morning Brown, I turned back to my templates, this time for the tsuka. For the blade to fit into the tsuka, I need to cut a recess into each of the two sides. The easiest way I've found to do this is with a handheld router. Again using the fit finder, I measure the thickness of the tang and set the depth of my router bit to exactly half of that thickness. After that, it's time to cut. Routers make a huge mess. So after a few seconds, I realized that I needed to set up some kind of dust collection. And then my battery died. But with both recesses cut, it was almost time to give the Tsuka a test fit. Before testing the fit, I use a spoke shave, more on this tool in a bit, and a chisel to knock off the sharp edges of the tang and refine the shape just a little more. On the first try it was close, but if you look, you'll see there was still a small gap, so back to the router we go. I adjust the depth of the cut ever so slightly because remember, anything I take off will be doubled since I'm cutting both sides of the suka. I shave just a tiny bit more out of the recesses and give the fit another try, and success! Happy with the fit of the suka, it's time to glue the two sides together. I want to use the tang of the blade to help line up the two halves, so I cover the tang with a few pieces of packing tape to prevent the tsuka from being glued to the blade, and I use some spring clamps to hold it all together. If I've learned anything from YouTube, it's that this is the easiest way to remove clamps. Who even does it one at a time anymore? Now that the tsuka is glued together, it's time to clean up those glue joints. First I run it over the joiner to take care of one of the sides. Then I go over to the table saw to square up the top and clean up the other side, taking off as little material as possible. Using a white pencil on walnut makes my lines easier to see. Now that I have the shape of the tsuka transferred from my template, it's back to the belt sander to refine the shape. This is the same process as before, and I take it slowly and sneak up on my lines. After I have the tsuka taken care of, I want to make sure the blade meets the tsuba, or blade guard, without any gaps. I use a combination of files to get it to fit just right. I even cut the tang a bit shorter to ensure there isn't any interference when I slide the tsuka on. A tsuka with sharp, square corners wouldn't be very comfortable to hold, so let's make a rectangular box more ovalish? 
I start by installing a roundover bit into my router table and ensure the bit is flush to the table by using an engineer's square. I take the plunge and run the carefully crafted suka against a spinning carbide bit, hoping I don't get any tear out. Since I'm using a larger roundover, I make the cut in multiple passes, which reduces the stress on the router and gives me a better chance of getting a clean cut. You thought we were done with templates, didn't you? Nope. Remember a few minutes ago when I casually dropped the word spoke shave? It's okay if you don't. But for those of you that do, the time is here. Blade sharpening time. Kind of. I mean, it's a piece of wood, so it can only be so sharp. This is my first time using a spoke shave. Nope, that's a lie. I did make a prototype sword and practiced a little bit on that one, so technically it's my second time using one, but either way, I'm impressed. I think I'm ready to start my career making and selling wagon wheels. But really, the spoke shave makes quick work of removing material and getting the blade closer to its final shape. As you can see, it even works well shaping the curve point and the point of the blade. After I finish with the spoke shave, how many times do you think I can say spoke shave? It's time to sand. This will be the first of a lot of sanding. I mean a lot. I cut most of it for the sake of the viewer, but just know that there was a lot. Don't worry, I'll keep reminding you how much sanding there was. With the blade one step closer to being done, let's move on to the tsuba, or blade guard. Off camera, I glued a piece of oak in between two thin pieces of walnut because I thought the contrast in the two woods in a sandwich of sorts would look nice. Let me know down in the comments if you agree. After tracing the shape of the tsuba, I used the bandsaw to cut it out and just as before I get really close to my line while still leaving just a sliver to be able to sand to. Here I use a sharpie to trace my template to give myself dark, defined lines that are easier to see when using the bandsaw. In order to cut out the decorative parts in the tsuba, I first drill a hole in each one of those parts. I then use my newly acquired Harbor Freight scroll saw to cut out these decorative elements. Here's the thing with Harbor Freight. We all know they don't make the best tools. But if there's something you want, and could occasionally use, it's okay to get it from Harbor Freight. It'll probably work the few times you use it, and you can take the money you saved and buy even more tools. As before, it's the Tsuba's turn to get some refinement courtesy of the belt sander. Since I can't get into the corners with such a large tool, I turn back the clock and bring out the files. They make quick work of those tight corners, and then I turn my attention to cleaning up the decorative cutouts. In order to file the rounded shapes of the cutouts, I use a plethora of files that I've been given or acquired over the years. The scroll saw leaves a fairly smooth cut, but there were still a few places that needed some attention. Don't worry about that chip out, you see. We'll take care of that soon enough. I didn't want the tuba to have a sharp edge, so I used a smaller roundover bit in the router table to soften the edges. Sorry, Dad. I had to use my hands here. The pads just weren't providing enough grip, and it felt like the router was going to fling the tsuba across the shop. Taking a little break from the tsuba, let's go back to the tsuka. I wanted to create a little lip for the ito to sit against once it was tied. You can see the ito in this shot. I think the blue is going to look great against the walnut once it has some finish applied. There's something satisfying about using a sharp chisel and seeing the wood curl away. I sharpened my chisels for the first time before starting this project and never believed the hype. I thought, how much sharper could they be? The answer is much sharper, and so much easier to work with. After a little bit of chisel work, I decided it was time to cut the hole in the tsuba that would accept the tang of the blade. Most of the materials cleared out using the drill press. Sorry, I forgot to film that. You can google videos of drill press in use if you need a visual. The marking knife you see me use to trace my lines helps define the cutout and gives the chisel somewhere to register on the wood. You can definitely cut a hole like this without a marking knife, but this way ensures the cutting edge of the chisel is going to start exactly where you want it to. Hammering away, I slowly cut the hole through a layer of oak and two layers of walnut. Once the hole is cut, I check the fit, and to my surprise, nailed it on the first try. And jumping back to the tsuka. In order to tie the knot with the ito, there needs to be a small hole at the end of the tsuka for the cord to pass through. I use the ito itself to mark where I want the hole to go and take out most of the material with the drill press. See, I filmed it for you this time. You're welcome. It really isn't that exciting. 
After the holes are drilled, I pick up my smallest chisel and get to pounding. I've seen people use wooden mallets for chisels so as to not mutilate the end, and I have to say, it works pretty well. A little more work with the chisel, and we have ourselves a hole. Didn't I tell you there would be a lot of sanding? I did. First up is the tsuka. Even though I used the round over on the router table to knock off all the corners, you can still see and feel some of the tool marks, and the arduous process of sanding through the grits will get rid of that. I wish there was a faster, easier way, but unfortunately there isn't. Sorry for the shitty quality here, I think I was zoomed in too far. It's time to put the sandpaper down for a moment and pick the files back up. The round over bit I used on the tsuba wouldn't fit in those decorative cutouts, so I'll have to round them over by hand. I start with the files and transition to sandpaper to refine the edges. The spoke shave, ha, said it again, left some marks on the blade that weren't smoothed out with that first round of sanding, so I'm using a raking light to identify them and then going over the blade again with 100 grit sandpaper to start the final shaping. This will get rid of the few gouges that were left. With that, there's only a little more sanding on the blade left to go. And if you weren't sick of sanding just yet, here's some more for you. I cut a few thin strips of sandpaper to get into the decorative cutouts on the tuba and enable me to mimic the roundover created by the router. Grit after grit, the tuba is finally done. You might be able to sense how overjoyed I was to be finished with it. After the tuba is finished, I slowly and painstakingly progress through the grits to achieve a buttery smooth finish on the sycamore blade and the walnut tsuka. At the beginning of a build, I always think to myself, self, the sanding won't be too bad. It'll go fast. And by the end of the project, after I'm covered in fine dust and my hands hurt, I don't know what I was thinking. Do you need a break from sanding? I know I do. Let's move on and make the habaki, or blade collar. Over at the table saw, I square up one edge of a thin strip of walnut and then set up a stop block to ensure I cut the two pieces to the same length. The habaki needs to be glued onto the base of the blade and having the pieces be curved will make that glue up much easier. In order to bend the wood, I wet one side and then put it on an old mug warmer. As the water evaporates, the wood curls along the grain lines. It's like witchcraft. To glue the habaki to the blade, I use a combination of wood glue and super glue. The super glue acts as sort of a clamp, curing and holding the piece in place while the wood glue dries and gives the joint strength. Once the first side is attached, I take a chisel and trim the excess on the sharp part of the blade. Then, it's just rinse and repeat with the other side of the habaki. To avoid the risk of black super glue squeezing out onto the blade, I only use wood glue and some masking tape as a clamp, and I let the glue set up overnight. The next day, I come back, remove the tape, and start shaping the bottom of the habaki. Here's a little trick. You can use glue and sawdust from sanding to fill in any tiny gaps like the ones I had here. A little more shaping, and then I trim the top of those two pieces before cutting the final piece of the habaki. After measuring, I used my chisel to make quick work of the cut because I was going with the grain. Or it's because I'm incredibly strong. I'll leave that up to you to decide. Some more glue and some more tape, and we're almost done. Once the glue is dry, I remove the tape and a small plane makes quick work of the overhangs on the top piece. A little bit of sanding finishes the shaping. After seeing the habaki against the tsuba, I felt it needed something to break up all that walnut. To do this, I came up with a few ideas, but ultimately settled on using the same sycamore the blade is made out of to create an accent piece that mimics the shape of the blade. So I cut a thin strip of the sycamore, shaped it, and glued it onto the first layer. Like I did before, I used a combination of glues, but this time I actually found my activator, which is the spray you see me using. When the super glue on the accent piece comes into contact with the activator on the habaki, it sets up immediately, negating the need for clamps or tape. I gave the glue a few minutes to cure and then trimmed any excess wood. Sanding came next, although with the pieces this small, thankfully it didn't take too long. The habaki is shaped and looking good. Some people think the most exciting part of a build is applying the finish, but I absolutely hate it. 
You've put all of these hours and all of this work into a project, and if you mess up the finish, none of that time matters because it's going to look like shit. That being said, Maker Brand Simple Finish has taken away a lot of that anxiety for me. Like the name implies, it is truly simple, and I have yet to mess it up. I wipe it on, I let it sit for about 10 minutes, and then I apply another coat to any spots that have dried out. After letting that second coat soak in a little while longer, I come back with a clean rag and wipe off any excess. Since it is a wax and oil finish, it protects the wood without leaving a plasticky feel like polyurethane would. Keep in mind that it is a low luster finish, and if I want a little more sheen, I just buff the piece with paste wax. I promise this isn't a sponsored video, I just want to share my positive experience I've had using the product. When starting this project, I had no intention of making a corresponding saya or scabbard for the katana. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I had to. I begin the process at the planer, smoothing out one face of the board. Next, I use the table saw to cut the piece to length, and then the joiner to square up one edge. Referencing the flat face created by the planer against the fence of the joiner, I run the board over the spinning blades. After a few quick passes, it's back to the table saw to cut the piece to width. I wanted to keep the grain lines in the middle of the board, so I cut about an inch off of each side. Now that I've addressed three sides, I go back to the planer to smooth out the fourth, but not before taking a moment to clean the sawdust off my apron. Here you can see the grain I was talking about. I wanted those arches to be near the center of the saya. Like the tsuka, the saya will have two mirrored pieces. I resaw the board in half, and then turned back to the planer to clean up the rough surfaces left by the bandsaw. When I cut out the blade, I saved the remaining pieces, and I'll use those to create the recess that the blade will fit in. Since it would be an exact fit otherwise, I used the belt sander to make the recess just a little larger and smooth out those bandsaw cuts. Making the saya will be a two-part process. First, I'll glue the blade off cuts to one side of the walnut that I just milled, using spring clamps as I did before. Since the blade needs to slide into this recess without any obstruction, I make sure to clean off any glue squeeze out before it has a chance to dry. A plastic drinking straw cut to a point makes quick work of this and avoids spreading tons of glue around with a rag. It conforms to the corner of the joint and kind of scrapes up the squeeze out. Being plastic, you can pop out the dried glue and use the straw over and over again. Just to be sure all of the glue is removed, I use a wet rag to wipe down the joint. After the glue has had some time to set up, it's time to remove the clamps. Did you think I'd only do this trick once? Nope. I had to find another spot to throw it in. Before gluing the other piece of walnut to the saya, I have to get it close to its final shape. Using a compass to offset my line, I trace around the blade cutout. As you can see, I drew two lines. After finishing the first one, I thought it seemed a little too chunky, so I closed the compass a bit and scribed the line closer to the cutout. After I was happy with the size of the saya, I go over to the bandsaw, yes, again, to cut out my rough shape. Did I cut right on my line? No! Pay attention! I think you'll start to see a pattern emerging here. If you guessed I would go right to the belt sander after cutting out the shape on the bandsaw, you would be correct. Here, I'm defining the final shape of the saya and sanding right up to my line. Being that I'm sanding two layers of wood, it takes a little longer than sanding something as thin as the blade. But I slowly sneak up to the line, and I'm one step closer to having an enclosed saya. To actually make the saya hold the katana, I have to glue on the second piece of walnut. I quickly trace my shape and cut it out on the bandsaw, making sure to stay about an eighth of an inch away from the line this time. This will give me plenty of room for error when gluing it, and I'll easily trim the excess with a flush trim bit later on. In order for the entire blade of the katana to fit into the saya, I have to make cutouts for the habaki, since it is a little thicker than the blade itself. I start by marking approximately where I want the cutout to be, and then I slowly chisel away the material. The sycamore piece gets cut flush on both sides, and I mark the end of my cutout with a chisel. To make quick work of the cutout in the outside piece of the saya, I use my handheld router to remove the bulk of the material like I did on the tsuka. A quick test fit, and everything gets cut flush. Using the router once more, I remove the material on the opposite piece of walnut. Another test fit, and it's looking good, so it's time to move on to gluing up the final piece. This time, instead of using the spring clamps, I opt for a little more clamping power by using some bar clamps. I use my work surface to clamp the saya to in order to ensure that it stays flat during the glue up. 
I don't want any sort of bend to the saya, as that would make getting the katana in and out of it very difficult. I tried to use as little glue as possible in order to minimize the squeeze out on the inside, but just to be sure, I cleaned it up with a wet rag the best I could. In order to get the freshly glued side to match the rest of the saya, I turned to the router table. After a quick bit change, I use a flush trim bit that makes quick work of, well, flushing up the sides. This is why I left it a little oversized when cutting it out on the bandsaw before. I take care of the end with the opening, using a Japanese pull saw which leaves a clean, flush cut. Similar to the tsuka, the saya wouldn't look or feel good with sharp, square edges, so I use a large round over bit to knock those edges down. Another quick bit change and those sharp corners get shaved away. Have you missed watching me sand? I hope you have, because here comes some more. I decided to try using my random orbital sander to speed up the process, but the thin width of the saya didn't make it very easy, so unfortunately, hand sanding it is. I refine the roundovers and work my way up through the grits, all the way up to 220. After what seemed like ages, it's finally time to apply some simple finish to the saya. Just look at that grain pop. At this point, the woodworking portion of this build is complete, and I move on to wrapping the tsuka with the ito. I feel like the Ito on a katana is the most recognizable part, so I didn't want to mess it up. Luckily, unlike polyurethane or paint, if I do something wrong, it's easy to unwrap and start over. Which I did. More than once. But in the end, I got the hang of it, and moved down the length of the tsuka pretty easily. The spring clamp was the star of this process, holding my work as I continue to make my way toward the kashira, or pommel. Apologies for my sexy legs in the shot. I'm supporting the spring clamp with my thigh as I move along so as not to break the holder I fabricated for this very process. To tie the Ito, the tsuka has to be continually turned over, so instead of leaving it laying on a table, I made the holder you see here. The tsuka slides onto it and then can freely turn, making tying the Ito as easy as it could possibly be. After the length of the tsuka is wrapped, a few final adjustments of the Ito are made to get it looking just right. With the Ito finally reaching the Kashira, I had to tackle another part of the build I was not looking forward to, tying the knot using that hole I put into the end of the Tsuka. For this process, as I often do, I turned to YouTube and found a video that showed each step of the knot tying. At first, I thought I would need some kind of special needle to do this, but in the video, a paper clip was used. So I followed suit and it worked like a charm. In order to easily slide the paper clip under the Edo, I rubbed a bit of paste wax on it before starting the process. Side note, it's amazing how easy it can be to find videos on such specific techniques. Obviously, some videos are better than others, but if you want to learn a new skill, I highly recommend starting with YouTube. All in all, I took a couple stabs at the knot, getting better with each round, and in the end, I'm very happy with the result. If you thought I was done tying things around wood, well, you were wrong. Next up, I have to tie the segeo. Traditionally, this cord is used to attach the saya to the person using it, but in this case, it's just decorative. I wanted to keep the design of the saya clean, so I did not put a kurigata on it. The kurigata makes for a more secure starting point to tie the segeo, but since this is purely decorative, I opted to start with a clove hitch knot. While I was a boy scout, Knots were never my thing, so I needed a quick refresher on how to actually tie a clove hitch. Once completed, I turned to a fantastic video I found about tying the segeo. Yes, that is a chopstick you see me using. It was the perfect tool to make sure the loops of the segeo didn't get pulled closed too soon. Unfortunately, after finishing, I realized off camera that I had tied the segeo onto the saya upside down. No worries though, since I did not include a kurigata, I was able to slide it off, turn it right side up, and slide it back on. You probably wouldn't have noticed that, but for some reason, I like to point out my mistakes. A little floofing of the ends of the cord, and the segeo is finished. I guess I kind of lied when I said the woodworking was done, but really, this is just using some epoxy, so is that even woodworking? I had nightmares of dripping epoxy onto the Edo I just painstakingly tied, so I covered up every single inch of it. 
To attach the tsuka to the blade, I mix up some 5 minute epoxy and carefully fill the recess. I make sure to coat the sides, and I do my best to spread out the gloopy mixture inside of the tsuka. After just a bit of procrastination, I only have a 5 minute working time, I'm at the point of no return. The blade gets inserted into the tsuka, and I wait, pretty impatiently, for the epoxy to cure. As I mentioned way back in the intro, I made this katana as a birthday present for a very important friend of mine. The only problem is that he lives on the other side of the country. So off camera, I built a foam line box to protect the katana on its journey to the desert. Fingers crossed the baggage handlers at Southwest don't throw it around too much. To add a little more protection, I'm planning on adding a layer of bubble wrap and cardboard, just in case. And with that, let's get to those beauty shots we've all been waiting for.